Good morning. Welcome to First Reformed Church. Thanks for joining us, worshiping our great God together this morning. If you're tuning in by watching online or through TV, we're glad you've joined us as well. If you have any visitors this morning, thank you for coming. Uh, If you have any questions, you can pretty much talk to anybody out in the back uh, after service. If you have specific questions, we have an information booth, and there's always someone there that would love to help you out. Um, After the service... uh, We'll have some coffee and cookies and cold drink down in the fellowship hall. You can go uh, and enjoy that. Uh, And then one more thing for our visitors, later on in the service, there'll be a friendship registry that gets passed down the pew. If you'd like, put your name and address in there and then send it on back down um, so we can connect with you. For announcements today, Young at Heart is taking a bus trip a week from tomorrow, uh, but please sign up today if you're interested in going, uh, or give Gloria a call, Gloria Upkenorth, since it's a limited capacity thing. So that's happening, bus trip for Young at Heart a week from tomorrow. Then for volunteers who are coming to help usher or greet at the Harvest America event uh, this evening here at church, um, you have a meeting with Pastor Brian in the north side of the fellowship hall. So he said you have enough time, if you hurry, to cut in line, get something to drink, and maybe a cookie, and then meet him in the north side of the fellowship halls for that meeting. So, um, but that's also, uh, by way of reminder, it's not too late. Coming out tonight for the Harvest America event, it's going uh, to be a fun time, great time of worship, great time to bring family and friends in um, and connecting with people uh, around America. So uh, come on out for that. Then, a food vault is in need of hot dog buns and jelly. Not necessarily to put together, but hot dog buns and jelly uh, for the food distribution that will be on Tuesday, June 26th. So sign up for those items are on the Children's Ministry Board outside the library. So if you can, sign up for that. And for our kiddos who are in fourth or fifth grade this past school year, Uh, We have a fun and yummy service opportunity planned for you on Thursday, June 21st. Uh, Just so you know, this day will include ice cream, okay? So sign up on the Children's Ministry Board outside the library if you're interested in ice cream and the event if you're in fourth or fifth grade, right? You can't just, Doug, you can't just sign up because you like ice cream, dude. It's not, no, fourth or fifth grade. There you go. There we go. With that, please take your bulletins home, read the rest, or you're all caught up on all that's going on here at FRC Oosberg. And with that, um, would you please stand and greet one another this morning?
Would you please pray with me? Lord Jesus, we come before your throne of grace, rejoicing in what you have done for us upon the cross. To give us eternal life, you paid the debt that was ours. Thank you for that gift of grace. We also are thankful that we can come and worship you freely. For many of our brothers and sisters across the world do not have that freedom. Also, Lord, prepare our minds and our hearts and our ears to listen and be responsive to the knowledge of your word as presented to us today. Come, Holy Spirit, rest upon us and work in us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. You can be seated. Our memory verse for this month comes to us from Colossians 3.17, and we're going to say that together, starting with the reference, then the verse, and follow it again with the reference. With one voice we say, Colossians 3.17, and whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Colossians 3.17. As we come to our prayer time this morning, just one announcement to bring, uh, just to kind of remind you in case you uh, heard already. If you haven't heard already, uh, we express our sympathy and extend our prayers to Francine, the master and family, following the passing of Gary uh, this past week. And I uh, just want to again remind you, visitation will be at the funeral, Wenning Funeral Home today from 2 to 6, and then uh, tomorrow here at church from 12.30 until service time, which is 2 o'clock. So keep that family and those things uh, in your prayers. Let us go to God then together in prayer. O Lord and Father of our household of faith, we thank you for the gift of faith worked within us by your Holy Spirit. We thank you for having called us to yourself, for consecrating us to your service, for having set us apart for the sacred ministry of the gospel. O Lord and Father of the household of faith, we pray for the church and all her breadth and variety, gathered out of every nation, family, people, and tongue to be a kingdom of priests serving you. We pray for the church and all the world, for the churches in North America, Europe and the Middle East, for churches in Africa and Asia and Latin America, for young churches and old churches, for small churches and large churches, for weak churches and strong churches. We pray for the Reformed Church in America, and specifically now its meeting of the General Synod. We pray that you will guide them, grant them wisdom, grant them discernment and faithfulness. We pray for First Reformed Church here in Oostburg and all our ministries and for our mission partners. We especially today remember Abraham and Sayuri kissed Okazaki in their ministry in Japan. We give thanks with them for the students who continue to come to their church in Tokyo from the university. We continue to pray for the Kugahara Church, and they will continue to reach out with the great love and the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. No, God, today we also pray for Harvest America and that event within the life of your church. And we pray, O oh God, that that event will be an instrument of your grace, an instrument of your word, reaching out into all the land, touching hearts and minds, bringing transform, transformation to lives. So God, grant to the church that true humility. Grant us, O oh God, that sense of unity. Grant her the truth that she may seek to proclaim it and live it. Grant, O oh God, wisdom so that we might walk according to your will 
and that we might fulfill the purposes that you have for your church. Oh God, we pray for this household of faith, and we pray for those who are stewards here for you, entrusted to the work of the church, for your pastors, for your elders, deacons, lay leaders, volunteers, committees and teams, and all who gather here in this place for all sorts of activities. Give them the spirit of willing service and true humility. Give them a sense of spiritual devotion. Give them delight in their service and in those whom they serve. Oh God, grant them joy that as they lead people in the way of Christ, that they will all sense your spirit guiding and walking along with them, leading them, blessing them along the way. Help us to celebrate, O oh God, those great things that happen in the life of the church that we might see and notice the work of your Spirit. Today, as we celebrate professions of faith, as Blaine and Josiah come, we celebrate, O oh God, and give thanks, and we pray that you will continue to bless them and lead them. Continue to bless as a church, O oh God, so that we continue to raise up disciples for Jesus Christ. Today we also celebrate, oh God, we celebrate with Jared Tindulli and Emily Tindulli as they celebrate being united here yesterday in the holy bonds of marriage. We celebrate what you have done and are doing in their life together now as husband and wife and pray, oh God, that you will bless them in their future. Oh Lord and Father of the household of faith, we pray for all people's in all nations. We pray that in every land there might be peace and true justice. Grant that in our own communities, those who are troubled, those who suffer, those who are discouraged might find support in time of need, especially, O oh God, from your church. We pray for our nation and those who lead the nation, the president, the advisors, Congress, and the courts, and the diplomatic corps, and the armed forces as they negotiate and work toward peace and justice. We pray for them. Grant them wisdom, Grant them your grace. And we pray for leaders of all nations that they all might know you and seek you and walk in your fear and your glory for the good of all. O oh Lord and Father of the household of faith, we come uh, lifting up to you those who have special needs, those who are dealing and suffering with any kind of health issues. We pray for healing and strength. We think especially this morning those recovering from surgery as we think of Eunice Lensink as she recovers doing therapy at Pine Haven. Mux Hanks as he continues to recover at home and doing therapy as well. And Chuck Daney as he continues his recovery uh, at us also. Grant them patience and strength in this time. We pray for those dealing with ongoing health issues like Paul Vervelde as he continues to deal with back pain and is on bed rest at home. Chip Limco, who continues under hospice care. Mary Lammers, as she continues her cancer treatments, and Tom Horn, as he continues to receive dialysis. Oh God, we ask for your wonderful, loving presence and power to bring help, to bring healing. You know what they stand in need of, God. May they know your presence with them. To all, God, who are troubled, give rest and understanding. To all who are lonely and alienated, give fellowship and love. To those who grieve and sorrow, and especially today we think of Francine and her family. And we pray, O oh God, that you will grant them your comfort and assurance. We bring all these requests, O oh God. These that we mention, those who are on our hearts and our minds, and we lift them before you, because you, O oh God, are a God of all mercy. And in the name of Jesus Christ, we come before you, the one who is seated at the throne with you at your right hand and intercedes on our behalf, and we lift all these things in that glorious name of Jesus Christ. And we pray it. Amen. This morning we have a chance to receive Blaine, Bruce, and Josiah Brugink, who are desiring to make profession of their faith. Because they 
admit that they're sinners saved by grace. They believe that Jesus Christ died for their sins. And because they commit to having Jesus Christ as their forever friend. Guys, you can stand at this time, please. It has been an honor and a lot of fun doing the Lessons of Assurance study with you. You guys came here after school. You were usually tired after a long day of school. And not only that, most mornings, you were usually in the weight room lifting some weights. And yet you had an endurance. You had good attitudes. And you tackled it with great teamwork. I appreciated the way that you guys worked together to be able to say, hey, I've got this one. And you would read the scripture. Or, hey, I'll take this one. And you would answer the questions. And when maybe the questions that you were answering weren't maybe on the right path, you were really good about saying, I, I don't get this one. And that takes courage. It takes courage to be able to say, I don't get it. It shows that you have a desire to grow in your faith, to want to go deeper, and to want to learn, and most importantly, to grow closer to Christ. And I'm so very proud of both of you for that. As we did the lessons together, there's one lesson that sticks out to me the most, and that was when we did the lesson of forgiveness, the assurance of forgiveness. And I'm sure that you guys probably remember why that one sticks out to me the most. You guys displayed great grace towards me on the day that we were doing that lesson, and I appreciate that very much. Now I know that the lessons that stick out to both of you are different for each of you. Blaine, yours is the assurance of victory. And Josiah, yours is the assurance of guidance. And we pray those things for both of you. We are so very excited for you as you take this next step. This isn't the final step in your faith. This is the next step, saying you want to grow and learn. And guys, I hope that you continue to have not only that fellowship time with each other and other believers, but you purposely take that Bible study time, that time of discipleship, so you continue to grow and learn. Congratulations, guys. We're really excited for today. And Blaine and Josiah, I ask that you come down in front. Um, I know it's scary up here, but I'm with you, so you can just stand here while I ask you these questions and ask you to respond to these questions. Do you believe that you are a child of God, that you belong to God, and that God shares his love and his grace with you? Your response. And do you accept the promises of God as given in his word for yourself? Your response. And do you acknowledge that you are born in sin and in need of a savior? And do you accept God's promise that Jesus alone can save you from the results of sin? Your response. And will you pray for yourself and for others? And will you make God's word a high priority in your life? Your response. And will you participate with this church family in worship, in making disciples, in fellowship, and in the church's purpose of proclaiming God's good news to a Christless world? Your response. Congregation, would you please stand? Congregation, would you accept the responsibility to live Christ in every area of your life for the benefit of Blaine and Josiah? And will you so walk with your Lord that they will see Jesus Christ living in you? Your response. Congregation, you may be seated. Josiah and Blaine, I'm going to ask you to come forward and kneel. And all of those who are going to participate in this time, the blessing, the laying out of hands, if you would come up at this time. Guys, you are well surrounded, I'll just say that. <laughs> Let's pray together. Defend, O Lord, these, your servants, 
Josiah and Blaine, with your heavenly grace, that they may continue yours forever and daily increase in your spirit more and more until they come to your eternal kingdom. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. Amen. Congratulations. Congratulations, Josiah. Congregation, please join me in welcoming Josiah and Blake.
sing together hymn number 261, Fill Me Now. Let's stand together to sing. Thank you. You may be seated. We're continuing our sermon series based on the book of Philippians and based on the encouragement that we find there. Uh, And I'm going to invite you to turn to chapter 1, verse 12. We're going to read verses 12 through 26 together. Listen to God's word from Philippians 1 at verse 12. Now, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. But what does this matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice. 
For I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to be with Christ, which is better by far. But it is more necessary for you that I may remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain. And I will continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith. So that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me. This ends the reading of God's word. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. All of us have certain things that occupy a good deal of our time. For many of us, it's our work. For some of us, it might be caring for our family. For others, school. Sometimes hobbies occupy quite a lot of our time. That's been true for me outside of work. I still am working, just to let you know, and it's more than one hour a week, as Pastor Bob said last week. But I, in this time of the year, I really enjoy gardening. And I've been working at my garden, have most of it planted, but up until earlier this week, there was one spot that remained. And I had strawberry plants ordered for that one spot, but they just weren't coming. In truth, I was getting anxious. I ordered them through the mail and got the initial um, confirmation that the order was complete. And then I heard nothing. I've gotten so used to, you know, ordering online and two, three days things are here. Here it is a, a week later and my strawberry plants are not here yet. Well, Monday afternoon I, I get a confirmation email that the strawberry plants were delivered. That was like a kid in a candy store. I was so excited because I had Monday night clear on my schedule and I was going to plant my strawberry plants and my garden would finally be complete. And then at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, I get an emergency phone call that says, we need you down to the hospital at Frederick Hospital. So Pastor Bob and I actually got in the truck and down to Frederick Hospital we went and spent some time down there and um, got home about 7.45 on Monday night. And what do I do? The first thing I did was to change my clothes. I didn't even stop to eat. Not that I really necessarily need to. I've got some reserves. But I was out in the garden as quickly as possible, planting those 75 strawberry plants. Would you believe that at about 20 after 9, yes, it was dark out, I completed that task of planting those strawberry plants. And life is good now that everything's complete in the garden. But you know, I'm kind of saddened by the fact that something really not so very important in my life can so much monopolize so much of my time and energy. And I'm really challenged by what the Apostle Paul says in this scripture lesson that I just read a moment ago. I'm challenged by a number of things, and I'm going to talk about some of those things as we go along. But I'm really challenged by the fact that Paul wrote this letter while he was in prison. From what we know, and our information comes primarily from, his, from the book of Acts, we find out that, that Paul spent two years in prison in Rome 
And during those two years of time, he wrote a number of letters, this being one of them. From what we know, Paul was under what we would call house arrest. He actually rented his own living space, but he was under guard. In fact, Paul uses the word hallucis to describe his bonds or his chains. He was literally chained by one wrist to a Roman guard who also had a chain around his wrist. So Paul, in a sense, was under house arrest. And Paul mentioned something really significant in our passage. He says, it had become clear throughout the whole palace guard that he was in chains for Christ. Palace guards. These were not your everyday run-of-the-mill guards. These were the elite probably hand-picked because they were a special group of guards. And Paul was likely chained to several of them, if not hundreds of them, throughout the two years of time that he was under house arrest in Rome. Imagine what happened during that time. Well, we know that Paul entertained a number of visitors during that time. But imagine the conversations that he likely had with those that he was literally chained to. And we don't know what the result of that was. I have to believe it had a huge impact on those guards. Probably not a few of them came to Christ as a result of that. And then think about the influence that those guards would have likely have had on those who were in their circle of influence. You see, it doesn't come through real loud and clear, but I believe Paul was super excited when he shared the fact that he had had the opportunity to really impact the whole palace guard because he was in chains for Christ. Notice, that he puts in there that it's become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. Paul wanted to make it known that the reason that he was in bondage was not because he had broke the law, not because of some politics, but because of his faith in Jesus. Let's stop there for just a moment. We had two young men. Blaine and Josiah, stand before us this morning and profess their faith in Christ. Took some courage for you guys to do that. Thank you for doing that, guys. But then think of what life was like in Paul's day. Just to profess Christ could mean that you would be thrown in jail for that. And that's precisely what had happened with the Apostle Paul. And as he sat in jail in Rome, he didn't know what the outcome of his impending trial would be. He talks about that in our scripture lesson for this morning. Paul was waiting, really, to find out what his fate would be. He didn't know if death would be the result or if that he would be set free. But notice Paul's perspective on his situation. I think the best summary statement in our scripture lesson of that perspective comes in verse 21 when Paul writes, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. To live is Christ. To die is gain. What did Paul really mean by that? I believe that for Paul to live, life was Christ. It was his relationship with Christ that was everything to him. That was life 
for Paul. Well, then how could to die be gain? I think Paul realized that when he died, he would be even closer to Christ. And from that perspective, he could write, for me to die is gain. Either case, live, die, I think the Apostle Paul felt like he couldn't lose. But he goes on to share his struggle between those two options. In verses 22 and through 24, he writes, If I go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Paul's personal choice would have been death because that would have meant that he would be with Christ, which he says is by far better. And yet, he knew that for the Philippians, for the Christians at Philippi, if it remained, it would be fruitful labor. That would probably be to strengthen them. And so he was torn between those two possibilities. And then he ends this section of Scripture with these words. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain And I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ will abound on account of me. Based on the fact that Paul felt it would would be better for the Philippians if he continued to live, he thought that's what would happen. He thought that he would be set free, that he'd have at least one more time to spend with the Philippians. Unfortunately, We have no record of whether that actually happened. In fact, at the end of Acts, in chapter 28, verses 30 to 31, we just read this summary of the time that Paul spent. For two years, Paul stayed there in prison in Rome in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him. Boldly and without hindrance, he preached the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ, which kind of leaves us hanging. We don't know if Paul actually made that one last visit to the Christians at Philippi. What we don't need to wonder about, however, is what was important to the Apostle Paul. I mentioned earlier, as I started, that Paul uh, was pretty excited about the fact that he had the opportunity to witness to the whole palace guard. What I failed to mention was the impact of Paul's imprisonment upon his fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. We read about that in verse 14, where Paul says, And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. One of the results of Paul's imprisonment was that Christians were encouraged by that. In fact, they became more bold in proclaiming the gospel message. Paul goes on then to elaborate about that preaching of the gospel in verses 15 through 18. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but other out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice, and yes, I will continue to rejoice. When I first read those verses, I was kind of confused as to what Paul was talking about. Here's what I've concluded. Paul was going on to elaborate about what the preaching of the gospel was like as a result of his imprisonment. And there were two groups. There were some who were sharing the gospel with the right motive and out of love and concern for the Apostle Paul. 
However, there was another group there that were sharing the gospel, but they were doing so with the wrong motive. They were trying to stir up trouble for Paul. It seems to me to best think about it as there were a group of Christians who maybe weren't big fans of the Apostle Paul. And they saw his imprisonment as an opportunity for them to gain converts. And so that's what they were doing. They took advantage of Paul's situation. Notice the Apostle Paul's response to that. But what does this matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. And yes, I will continue to rejoice. When I read that, I went, wow. I have to believe that if I had been in Paul's shoes, sitting in prison, and there was a group of Christians there taking advantage of that situation, trying to gain converts, trying to gain followers, I'd have been ticked, to say the least. Not Paul. You see, Paul, I think, had an eternal perspective on what was happening. And the end result was that the gospel was being preached. Now, keep in mind, this was not a false gospel that was being preached. This is not talking about the Judaizers who created all kinds of conflict for Paul. If that would have been the group that Paul was talking about, he would have been ticked too, and he would have been up at arms. But that wasn't the case. Paul was not upset. He was rejoicing. And that says something about how important the spread of the gospel was to the apostle Paul. I started out this morning by saying how challenged I was by this passage of Scripture. This is the part of that Scripture that challenges me, that Paul, in the midst of his imprisonment, and in the midst of facing a group of Christians who were kind of out for their gain, is still rejoicing that the gospel message, the good news of salvation in Jesus, was being preached. I don't know about you, but I think we've lost some of that sense of urgency that the Apostle Paul had when it comes to the gospel. I think we sometimes think, well, it's kind of an old-fashioned message, right? Kind of outdated. Or maybe we think, well, it's not on me to do that, right? Let's call in the pastors and evangelists. They're the ones who have the mission of proclaiming the good news. But that's not the way it works. We don't, first of all, need to preach a sermon to proclaim the good news. Sometimes it's simple as sharing with someone what Christ is doing in our lives. Don't forget about tonight with the Harvest America event. I can assure you that the gospel message will be proclaimed through song and through the message that Greg Laurie is going to be delivering tonight. Be sure to come out for that. And don't come alone. Invite someone else to come with you. The Apostle Paul could get excited about the fact that the whole palace guard had, had heard the good news and knew that the reason he was in prison was because of his relationship with Jesus. Because he knew for himself on a personal level, the impact that that gospel message had on his life. It changed him from being a persecutor of Christians to arguably the best proclaimer of the gospel message. And that mission that Paul was on, of proclaiming that good news, is the same mission that God calls us to as well. Please pray with me. Father, thank you 
for that gospel message, the good news of salvation in Jesus. Help us to not be quiet. Help us to share that good news. Give us the boldness and courage to do so for your honor and for the building of your kingdom. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You have the opportunity to respond to God by giving your offerings. I'm going to dismiss the fifth graders at this time. Fifth graders, those of you who just completed fifth grade, I'm going to send you out to the shed where Lori is, and you're going to spend some special time in prayer this morning. Thank you for doing that. The bells are going to lead us with our ministry music.
Gracious God, we give you thanks that you are a generous and loving God, that you have come to us in beautiful ways and blessed us beyond measure. And so we come in response to that, knowing of your goodness, knowing of your great love for us in Jesus Christ, knowing that you are faithful. And we bring these gifts as a sign of our thanksgiving, as a sign of our commitment. And may, O God, these gifts, and by giving them, may we be emboldened to greater acts of faith. Bless, O God, these gifts and the givers, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to end the service a little bit differently than normal. What I'm going to ask you to do is after the song is finished, if you would just go ahead and have a seat again uh, for a brief announcement. Uh, If you would do that after we finish our closing song, that way the cameras are off and we can have a brief announcement to take place at that time. Okay, Brothers and sisters in Christ, go forth. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit guide you and bless you as you proclaim Christ in all that you do and in all that you say. And all of God's children said, Amen. Amen. Please be seated.